Cuba, large cups of delicious caipirinhas, carnival, insanely gorgeous women. These are just some of the things that make Rio a desirable destination for vacation. But to truly appreciate the city's color and culture, it is important to pay homage to the people who built it. Prior to slavery in the States, Brazil's indigenous tribes were colonized by the Portuguese, and hundreds of thousands of enslaved Africans were brought to Brazil. As it is in other Latin American countries, the contributions of these African ancestors are seldom recognized or celebrated. Most of Brazil's development and success came from the minds of its great black thinkers. But you kind of have to discover this information on your own. There aren't any major monuments or statues erected in honor of these leaders. So where does one go to learn about Black history in Rio? Good morning, my name is Sabaki Baruti, and today we're on the Afro Rio walking tour. Uh, I moved to Rio de Janeiro in 2003. I've been here for 15 years. And when I came here, I had no idea, none whatsoever, that Rio de Janeiro would become my home, that I would stay here and love this city and live in this city and build this project about this city. What happened when I first arrived was I was immediately thrown into a big cultural difference about the question of race and color and how that plays out in Brazil in ways that are very different from the United States. So in order to explore the origin of those differences or to begin to understand the Brazilian concepts and systems around race and color, I decided to go back to the beginning and to look for the African history of the city and to compare the institutionalization of chattel slavery and what may have happened differently in the two countries historically that would lead to why these two countries, which on paper, ostensibly, would be identical and yet so different on the question of race and of color. So this area is called Paper Versailles, the so and it is most famously known for being the birth of Samba. And that is true. This is where Samba was born. And the reason that, that Samba was born here was because the stevedores, the dominoes, uh, in between waiting for ships to offload the ships, they would gather here to socialize. And they'd mess around. They'd mess around with music and with poetry and with musical instruments. And so the Samba rhythm was born here. So when we focus on something like uh, uh, samba, which is you know one of Brazil's great patrimony, sometimes uh, we want to gloss over or skip over the three centuries before that <laughs> and what it was that led to that moment and how it was that samba came to be born in a location like this. So at the same time that people gather here every Monday night for a fabulous samba party, um, and other kinds of Samba events that go on here, and that the care and the love for this place, there really is you know, a very long history before that that leads up to that. And so this neighborhood here, most people don't know this, but this is a quilombo. Do you know the word quilombo? This is the Brazilian word for a maroon community. So this was the area that runaways free blacks, free Africans, and runaways would come into this neighborhood. And this is one of the oldest black communities in the Americas. And so those blacks and Africans then constituted, reconstituted the, a social life in the world. Wow. Yes, this is where, this is the neighborhood where that happened. And so when we talk about slavery in the States, we're talking about agriculture. We're talking about vast cotton plantations indigo tobacco. We have a southern and a rural image about what slavery was and what, how, what, how it happened. The history is in our country. We're talking about Rio de Janeiro. We're talking about urban slavery, which is something we don't talk much about in the United States. So what we have here is a city that by the early 19th century, when the uh, Portuguese crown arrived in 1808, half, 50% of the population of Rio de Janeiro was enslaved. It was the largest urban slave population since the Roman Empire. At that moment, for all of Brazil, one third of Brazilian population was enslaved. So, what is urban slavery? What were these people doing? There are basically three main categories. 
uh, of, of uh, urban sites. And the first one is the domestics. So that's primarily the women and the girls, and they're inside of the homes doing the domestic work. Then you have what was called the escravadão de ganho, the earning slaves. And that person had to go get a job, but had no rights to a salary or a wage. So the party who was the master in that contract received the wage for the work of the enslaved party. Wow. Okay, so that work was a lot of the destruction. Literally built the city. Um, transportation, uh, delivery of, uh, of goods, and also of people. Do you remember those those chairs with the big poles on them? And they, uh, yeah, that was Kravadan Jigang. Right. So moving people and goods around the city. Uh, that was the work of enslaved people. Uh, water. Going to the public fountains and carrying fresh water back to the home. That was the work of enslaved people. And then you had another category that was called the chikri, or the tiger. And that was a low status uh, enslaved person. And those were the people who carried the waste out of the homes and then dumped it into the bay. And so those were men, they would have huge jars on their heads, and those jars were filled with waste. And by waste, I mean human. And as they walked through the city, they would slop and slop around and drip down over their bodies. And the acid from the urine would then mark their skin. And they would have a striking pattern on their skin. And so they were nicknamed the kind. And then the lowest status of the enslaved Africans was the one who didn't have a master. No one purchased you, and you were left tethered in the slave market. And what happens in the city is that for a variety of reasons, um, they want younger and younger girls working in the house. And that the women who are working in the households, they have a higher status. Um, and so they become the most able and the most likely to get their manuscripts. So these African women, they come into the city with marketable skills, right? They cook, sew. Sewing was a big thing um, because the, the European women, the Portuguese women, they had this uh, inferiority complex about being stuck off in the colonies that they weren't in Europe. So they had to have everything like the Europeans. They were very obsessed, especially with fashion, with French fashion. They had to have everything. Um, well, who's going to sew elaborate fresh, uh, French fashions in colonial period and narrow? Black and African women. So these women, they were able to get together some resources, um, selling foodstuffs, uh, 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 preparing foodstuffs and having food carts in the streets, um, sewing, uh, these kinds of uh, child care, uh, taking care of children. And, you know, we have to be, we're talking about history, we have to be honest about it, we don't want to gloss over it, but we don't want to focus on it. But prostitution as well. This was another way that black women have survived for centuries um, out of necessity. These women then are able to put together some resources and they're able to get a little house. Like if we look at this little simple one story house here, they can build a little house. And so then what happens? is with this um, Escravadan Giganio, these men, they're enslaved people, but in order to complete this contract that's put on them, they're geographically free. They have to be able to move around the city to earn this money that goes to the person designated as the master. So that's a little bit different for us as, as African Americans. Is Oh, no, they do have to move about the city. So what happens is these social circles of men start to form around these women because they have a house, because they got a pot of beans on. Their women anchor the community. So enslaved people could have property, they could have money as long as they could hide it. Well, where are you going to hide it? They had food, they had some resources uh, that they could distribute, that they could share. So these African traditions, and many of these women were high priestesses in the Congo Blay and the African uh, religious practices. These then became very powerful women in the subaltern world that establishes itself in the same way. 
So when we talk about these contributions of Africans and Afro-Brazilians to Brazilian culture, to the Brazilian patrimony, we're very quick to point to a location like this and talk about samba. But what we're not so quick to talk about is when the Portuguese first had contact with the old kingdom of Congo in the late 15th century, they were stunned with their political system. Because the old kingdom of Congo, they had a king, it was a it was kingdom. But so what they had though was an elected council that advised the king. And so the Portuguese, they have an elected council that advises the king. So when Brazil splits from the Portuguese crown in 1822, when the crown's called back to Portugal, and the son says, no, I'm going to stay, and he establishes himself as the king and emperor of Brazil, what does he do? He institutes um, uh, an assembly. There's a legislative body to his government. So we thought, oh, Samba is a great African contribution to Brazil. OK, yeah, that's true. Let's not deny that. Let's celebrate that. But you know what else came out of this neighborhood? Voting. Democracy. Representation. So it was also the political system. Be able to uh, practice the religion as they knew in the homeland or, or, or went back to the way. Yes and no. What happens is that the Portuguese deliberately mix around the Africans who are of different um, ethnic groups, different nations. So the Africans who are grouped together don't speak the same language. They're not from the same regions, right? And so what happens is they have similarities in their religious practices. So the Brazilian African religions, like Congolese, we have to understand them as, as Brazilian religions. They, again, they're reconstituted in the new world out of the necessity of this So when we talk about mixing in Brazil or mixing in, in the United States, we're usually talking about racial mixing. But the mixing that happens first is the forced mixing of the Africans. They're forced to mix first. Um, and so in this mixing then, you have these similarities and practices. What would happen was the Portuguese had no idea. They couldn't control this population. And when you go back and look in the record, and these meetings that they have, I can't control my slaves, I can't control my slaves. How are you controlling your slaves? I can't control my slaves. They were maddened by what I call the African calendar. There would be moments where all of the enslaved, they just, they just, the Portuguese would wake up in the morning and everybody would be gone. <laughs> <laughs> and then three or five or days or a week later, they would wake up in the morning and everybody would be back doing their job. There were these moments that for the Africans, they needed to go to certain locations. You needed to go to the river or you needed to go to the waterfall or you needed to climb up the top of a mountain as related to the spiritual practices. And so after a while, you just decide, okay, well, Sean goes at the waterfall on Wednesdays, and then that becomes institutionalized, and then that becomes a group, and then that gets passed along. So the African religions in Brazil are actually Brazilian religions. Nobody practices candomblé anywhere in Africa, but candomblé is clearly African rooted. For more on Rio's Black history, visit Sadakni's website, afrorealwalkingtour.com. The site has a wealth of information and an interactive walking tour guide that you can follow while visiting this area of Rio. Next, we went to the Volongo, a site that was uncovered during a drainage project for the 2016 Olympics. Sadakni explained the legal battles that ensued to preserve this area and told us the story of two of Brazil's great thinkers. So what happens is the main slave market is located in downtown Rio de Janeiro in Praça Quincy, next to um, the Imperial Palace, Paso Imperial. And so as the city is growing and becoming a city, this horror, this absolute unspeakable horror is right in front of the Paso Imperial, which is where the Viceroy of Brazil lives. So the abolitionists who are working out of the black church, the black senate abolitionists, they are putting pressure on the viceroy to shut down to end the slave trade. He cannot deny it. It's literally under his nose. He has to listen to the screams, okay? He has to smell the stench of the dead bodies that are piling up. There's no place to put the dead bodies. It's in front of his face. It is undeniable. But of course the empire is 
entirely dependent on the wealth that's being generated from the slave trade. So, in the end, he decides to commission the Bolongo. He's going to move it out of downtown area, okay, away from the wealthy. So at that time, this was the remote outskirts. This was the out of sight uh, area of the city. So the trade moved then here to the Volongo. So this was not even operational until 1811, really. This was a very, very short period of time. The Volongo was commissioned, I think, in um, 1770s, maybe? Um, late 18th century. So what the Volongo is, if you're asking me, and you're here today asking me, the Volongo <laughs> is um, port logistics. It's port logistics infrastructure when your main economic activity is human bodies. What happens now is that the ships drop anchor in a little bit deeper waters and then the Africans are sorted off of the ships as to whether or not they're fit for market. So people who are too sick, too weak, they are taken to an island um, uh, where they had what was called a fattening house. And that's what it was called, Casa de Engordamento. It was a fattening house. And you were kept at the fattening house and you were shoveled with food until you were deemed fit for market. If you were fit for market off of the ship, then you would be loaded to a smaller boat. And then the smaller boat would come here and you would be offloaded into the Belongo, which is a warehouse. It's a dock and a warehouse. Okay? okay? And then you set up this economic system. You've got your warehouse or your wholesale, and then you've got your retail, your resellers. So <clears throat> that now the Belongo, like I said, you've got the fattening house, you've got this warehouse here, and then, uh, as I mentioned, we'll be going to the cemetery because that was another early problem with the project. If, you're, if your project is predicated on two genocides, your first logistical problem is to use the bodies. So this question of burial, where were the Africans buried? Right now, you know, as we're speaking today, in front of the St. Rita's Church, there had been an African cemetery there before the Volongo was built. But the market was still downtown at Plaza Quinta. What, what are they doing there now? They're building line three of the light rail. So they have found the foundation of the slave market on that street. They found some other foundations of even a, a church. People have forgotten it ever been built there. They've discovered that. And we know where the cemetery was located. We know. And they have refused to excavate it. They have denied. They're not going to excavate the, the slave cemetery at the front of St. Rita's Church, where they're building the third line of the light rail. This is from the Institute of uh, the Preto Novos, where we're going to go, the, the cemetery, and that's their slogan here. Falta respeto na vida, falta respeto na morte. There's no respect in life, there's no respect in death. Oh, let's change the subject. Okay. <laughs> we'll talk about Andre Cabosas, he's my personal Afro-Brazilian hero. This man's name is Andre Cabosas, and Andre Cabosas and his family moved from Salvador, Bahia, to Rio de Janeiro when he was a little boy. And he saw in the streets of Rio de Janeiro these tigres carrying the waste out, and he saw the escravadão uh, carrying the water in barrels through the streets, and he was so horrified, he swore when he grew up he was going to put an end to it. Now, a lot of us, when we're little kids, we make all kinds of promises about what we're going to do when we grow up. But my man, Andre, he grew up and he put an end to that. He's responsible for the modernization, modernization of sanitation in Rio de Janeiro. Oh, wow. <laughs> he put an end to it. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes. And he reformed the docks. So this building here, this warehouse, is the flagship building of this Pedro Segundo dock project that was engineered by Andre Cabosas. So he modernized the docks in Rio de Janeiro, he modernized sanitation in Rio de Janeiro. He modernized the ports in various cities, about seven or eight different cities in Brazil. He was wow. Brazil's first civil engineer. Wow. Okay? His parents were lawyers. He came from an upper class free black family. And uh, he was the black sheep, if you want, if you will, who didn't want to go into law, didn't want to carry on the family business. He wanted to be an engineer. 
There were no engineering programs in Brazil at the time. He had to go to Europe to get his education. So he returns to Brazil as Brazil's first civil engineer. So he was a member of the elite, you know, uh, of the wealthy elite. He was uh, very close with Dom Pedro II, the emperor. And he was a lifelong abolitionist, one of the few who did get to live to see the day. He was alive mm. on May 15th, 1888. That Africans and afro Brazilians and the, um, the abolitionist movement, they cast their lot with the crown. They were afraid of a republic because they knew who would have the power in a republic. So they didn't want a republic. They thought they could work with the crown. And they could because this is going to shock you too. The crown in Brazil they were supporting the abolitionists and they freed all their slaves and the crown, the royal family did not use slave labor. They had no slave labor in the palaces. Why? Because they were the only European crown who ever set foot in the colonies and saw a slave market. King George was never in Charleston. No other European crown had set foot anywhere in the American colonies, except for the Portuguese crown. They saw it with their own eyes. So at the same time that they're economically dependent on it, because it's funding their empire, they're also appalled by it. So we had an abolitionist crown who wouldn't end slavery, who didn't want to end slavery. the planter class, the merchant class, right. Who were they? They were on the assembly. Remember, the crown had an assembly. So, when the crown fell and the royal family went into exile and went to Paris, Andre Hobosus went with them. <laughs> he didn't believe in a Brazilian republic. He didn't believe he'd have a place in a Brazilian republic. So after that, he bounced around. He was in Luanda and Angola doing some projects there. He was a journalist in, uh, in uh, uh, Portugal, um, Lisbon. He was in Lisbon. He ended up settling on the island of Mayena. And tragically, his body was found at the base of a cliff in front of the hotel that he'd been living in. So his death is considered to be a suicide. But as we know, once you're dead, oh, then they brought his body back to Rio de Janeiro. Then there was a full state funeral. Mm -hmm. Then he's a national hero. Right. So he is buried here in Rio de Janeiro, and I did. I went and found his grave. And I go and visit his grave and tend his grave. Wow. And I've sworn to him, I will put his name on every tongue in this city where it belongs. Machado de Assis. He's known as the greatest black writer in Brazil. He was the founder of the Brazilian Academy of Letters mm. and its first president. He was born up on this street. The house is there, and we know that that's the house. There's not even a plaque on it. People live there. After he was rich and famous, and in his adulthood, the house where he died, um, that house has actually been dismantled. It's not doesn't even exist. And if you go out to that neighborhood, there's a post with a plaque on it, and there's not even a house. So let's let's walk and talk a little bit about Machado and what it means to not know who he is and who he was and how we how we recovered the story. Machado is often <laughs> compared to Shakespeare, the greatest writer of the Portuguese language. He's like the Shakespeare of Brazil, the Shakespeare of Portuguese literature. So he's required reading. Every Brazilian who's gone to high school has read his work. But you ask anybody about that work, and they're like, ah, ah, ah. Okay, <laughs> well, let me ask you, what can you tell me about uh, A Midsummer Night's Dream? Shakespeare. Uh, Shakespeare. I know it. Yeah, exactly. Know it, and that's what, that's Machado. Like, yeah, I think I had to read that in high school. Yeah. So we have the problem with him not being taught properly. So Machado's father, was, um, I believe he was a house painter. Uh, his mother was a washerwoman. But unfortunately, at a very early age, he became orphaned. One by one, all of the members of his family died. And so he ended up being adopted by the family 
that had owned his grandfather's family. So this is one of the things that happens in Brazil uh, with abolition, is what we call the reconstitution of asymmetrical relationships. But uh, after abolition, what happens then are these big kind of adoption schemes. And so in some parts of the country, this is still going on, where one family and its descendants are the servants or the help, yes, to another family. For and it passes generation to generation. Um, because unlike the United States, I mean, you have a civil war, so then you have reconstruction. Right. So you have this moment of national disruption. You know, you have a disruption on a national level, and that creates a space for some mobility. So you get the Great Migration, and things change dramatically uh, in that period of reconstruction until that state can reorganize the mechanisms of control of Jim Crow, of, yes, uh, of the rise of the Klan uh, to, to reestablish that, that control. But you've got this, you know, open window moment. You know, you got this up in the air moment. That never happened in Brazil. The Empress came out, the Princess came out, she announced the slaves were free, she went back inside and finished eating her breakfast. So Machado's adopted then by this family that had owned his grandfather's family. And um, uh, Machado was a, he's a very mysterious character. Um, and he's actually known as the Witch of Corfi uh, Velho. That's the name of the neighborhood he ended up. The, um, and he was, uh, he did marry, but he never had children. And he was very kind of a hermit, very isolated. Um, and he had epilepsy, which was not very well understood either. So he became a very, very prolific writer. Um, chronicles, uh, newspapers, uh, novels, plays, very, very prolific writer. And so, as we rebuild our Afro-Brazilian or Afro-Carioca pantheon of greatness, every group of people wants their, their great ones on the wall. Uh, we're no different, fair enough. Everybody wants to point to their ethnic pride, their group's pride, right? So when it comes to putting someone like Machado on the wall, um, it becomes a little bit of a problem of what do we call him? How do we, how do, we do that? Because if we call him Brazil's greatest black writer, it suggests that there were non-black or white writers who were as great or greater than he was. Mm -hmm. And that's not true. So he's not Brazil's greatest black writer. That's not true. So, um, we also have the difference with the United States. It's pretty easy to construct a pantheon. <laughs> because when you're 13% of the population, anything a black person does becomes great blackness. Mm -hmm. It's really easy to identify. Well, here, half the population's black, conservatively mm -hmm. speaking. If we use United States definitions, 85% of the population is black. Right. right. So, Nigeria doesn't produce great black writers. They just produce great writers. Great writers, yeah. Their blackness doesn't have anything to do with it. Right. So now what do we do? Machado's the greatest writer. But it does matter that he was black. Right. Because that does matter in Brazil, in the history of Brazil. So I thought long and hard of it. And he's also not just the greatest in Brazil. He's the greatest in the Portuguese language. His greatness extends beyond Brazil. So I thought long and hard about it, and I decided what we must call Machado is that we must say that the greatest writer in the history of the Portuguese language was black and a Brazilian. That's who Machado de Assis was. So what happens in 1996? This couple buy a house on the street and they're going to do some renovations. And as they start digging in the backyard, bones come up. First they think they're animal bones, but then there are more of them. And then you realize they're human bones, and she thinks that maybe they're going to murder her. And then there's more bones, and she's, then she thinks, was there a serial killer? Mm. And so she calls the authorities, and they come in, they do the excavation, and they say, no, this is where the cemetery is. And so this is her home. So this woman, instead of having living room furniture, instead of having sofas and chairs and television set, she had the display cases from the findings of the archaeology. And you could call her up, you come to her house, and she'd invite you in her home 
and tell you the story, show you the archaeology, and then she take you into this little room where she's always had the artwork of local Afro-Carioca artists hanging and for sale. She's always supported the local black artists here. And then she'd have the coffee pot with a little basket. And she just kind of hoped you'd drop a little love into the basket next to the coffee pot. And she'd stand there like this and tell you the story. That's how I met her in 2004. We had built this place, it took them 10 years to buy the adjacent property to be able to open the uh, NGO, because it's a, it's a research institute, it's the institute, yeah, now. Um, uh, she and her husband, her children were there, this is their life, they dedicated their lives to this. And uh, she has had this construction going on at her doorstep. And the same problems again with the archaeology and with the fights. And we're going to see how close this track is, right up to her front door. The new administration, the first thing they did was cut her budget. After 22 years, <laughs> she's sitting here operating month to month, begging for donations. And don't know if it matters, and don't know if it should matter, but you might not realize this, that they're closing this whole story. These are white people. Wow. Mercedes is the daughter of Spanish immigrants, and her husband, Patricio, is a Portuguese descendant from Spain. And they have dedicated their entire lives to this project. So I'm going to take you there, and the thing that I want you to remember is that the only reason this place exists is because those people decided that it couldn't not. Right. Yeah. That's how it got done. Our final stop with Sadakni was the Instituto de Pesquisa y Memoria Pretos Novos, a memorial and research institute dedicated to the preservation of Rio's black history. Inside, we admired the art of local artists and paid our respects to the 30,000 Africans buried here. We also had the honor of meeting Merced, the woman who discovered these remains and converted her home into the memorial and institute that stands today. IPN's website offers more info on its work and its service to the community. Drop a little love at the donation page and be sure to add this walking tour to your itinerary when visiting Rio. I hope this video inspires you. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Ciao.